Welcome to Ask the Expert with the Sugar Science. And today our guest, uh, our host is Richard Benninger, PhD. He's coming to us from CU, basically the, uh, the a big hub of diabetes research, the Bi Barbara Davis Center for Childhood Diabetes at the University of Colorado, um, Anschwitz Medical Campus. And um, the Benninger Lab is a multidisciplinary team of scientists who are really guided by engineering principles and technologies to really understand the endocrine pancreas. Oops, sorry, I want to admit everyone. Um, and, you know, with mechanistic uh, knowledge underlying the dynamics of islet function and hormone release, they want to develop diagnostics and therapeutic inventions, interventions to effectively manage care, which we like that, uh, uh, that word, and prevent diabetes. Towards the goal, the lab combines novel optical imaging, ultrasound imaging, and approaches uh, to study the function of the islets of lamb hands over multiple levels of organization and look at how the function is disrupted in diabetes. Um, their research includes systems bio biophysics of the islet of Langerhans and diabetes, electrical synapse gap junction uh, channel plasticity, cell heterogeneity and emergent multiple properties of the islet and advanced optical microscopy and ultrasound imaging, as I mentioned earlier, um, and imaging diagnostics for type 1 diabetes. They, um, the title of this talk today is, is there a pulsatile pacemaker in islet cells or not? And this is really interesting because there's been a lot of work around this, you know, yes, no, maybe. And so I cannot wait to hear um, Dr. Benger kind of lay it all out for us. So welcome. Thank you so much for joining us and um, take it away. Thank you, Monica. And just check, you can hear me okay? Yes, perfectly. Okay. Great. Okay, yeah, so thank you for the um, invite and thank you for sort of suggesting a title uh, I've made a tiny modification, but basically, are there pulsatile pacemaker cells in islets or not? And just as an advanced guide of my answer is, is uh, sort of. And I'll and like anything in biology, there's no you know complete hard yeses and nos, and so we lie somewhere in between. And I'll sort of lay out my reasoning for that. So let's start with a, a definition. What is a pacemaker? So pacemaker is some system or process that drives rhythmic activity. And in a biological system, it drives rhythmic activity in the, in, in the uh, physiological system. And so classic examples are cardiac pacemakers, but also pacemakers driving locomotion or breathing, where you have sort of rhythmic behavior. Um, if we look a bit closer in the heart, in the heart, the sinoatrial node, which is made up of sinus nodal fibers, that serves as the pacemaker. But we should note other cells also have rhythmic activity, such as the AV node and the Purkinje fibers. They're just a bit slower. Um, and the sinoatrial node basically performs two main roles. Okay, first, it triggers action potentials in other cardiomyocytes that wouldn't otherwise generate an action potential uh, spontaneously. And so, you know, you have the firing in the SA node that sits sort of in the right atrium. You get propagation through the atria, across the AV node and down through the ventricles. And if you look at the sinoatrial node action potential, it's got this sort of spontaneous um, depolarization at rest that generates an action potential. Whereas in the ventricular fibers, basically at rest, they will not do anything, but the sinoatrial node triggers an action potential in that fiber. So it triggers action potentials in other cardiomyocytes, but also you have these other centers that will show rhythmic activity. And so it basically entrains a free, the faster oscillation frequency in those rhythmic cells. So for example, if you lack an SA node, some of these other centers will pace the heart, but they'll just pace it slower. So it's doing these two roles, it's triggering action potentials and it's entraining the frequency of other cells. So why are we interested in pacemakers in the islet? So insulin release has long been observed to be biphasic and pulsatile. So it has this classic sort of biphasic first phase and then slower elevating second phase. This is 
um, data from a conscious mouse and the glucose clamp. And this is uh, from sampling from the portal vein or sorry, the hepatic vein. In human, you have this large first phase and these pulses of second phase insulin. And it's been shown by um, a few investigators, for example, Peter Butler's lab um, and others, that pulse tile insulin has this greater action, particularly in the liver, than if you sort of have continuous uh, levels of insulin. And this pulse fertility is disrupted in diabetes, very early in diabetes. And so that sort of triggered for a long time a lot of interest in this sort of rhythmic um, secretion of insulin. Now, if you look at isolated islets, you have also see this uh, oscillations of insulin, and that's underlied by oscillations in calcium. So this, at least these pulsatile uh, second phase uh, insulin is sort of underlined by uh, these sort of uh, oscillations in electrical activity and calcium. So this question, is there an islet pacemaker as, as uh, goes back a long time? Uh, this is um, from the ninth, a study from the 90s that measures pulsatile insulin from uh, isolated human islets. And they made the important point that if, you know, if whether you look at low glucose or high glucose or with uh, arginine or glucagon or torbutamide, the insulin, of course, that's released varies uh, enormously. It's stimulated by glucose and amplified, for example, by glucagon. But the period of oscillations didn't change substantially. And so that suggested, okay, that irrespective of the mechanism by which insulin is secreted and amplified, is there some intrinsic pacemaker in the islet that's pacing these oscillations? And um, in terms of the pacemaker, I think, you know, it's, uh, there's a lot of work has been done on this, particularly by Les Satin that sort of determined what the mechanism is that underlies these oscillations and sort of generates a rhythmic pacemaker system. Uh, for example, if we look at the mechanism by which insulin is released, you have glucose transport, you have uh, its metabolism uh, set by glucokinase, and ultimately through mitochondrial metabolism, you generate ATP, you have closure of the KTP channels, that depolarization activates other channels, and you have calcium influx that triggers insulin release. There's uh, additional calcium handling, that calcium can be pumped out or taken up and released uh, via the ER. And that uh, calcium can also generate oscillations, for example, by inhibiting these potassium channels or activating, sorry, these potassium channels. So you get this sort of electrical oscillation, but also this ATP can feed back and generate oscillations in uh, metabolism and thus oscillations in KTP closure. And so you have these sort of mechanisms that are still being fully worked out where feedback generates an oscillation in the beta cells and sort of, if you like, forms that uh, pacemaker process. But we're sort of, the title of the talk is are there pacemaker-like cells making that analogy with the heart? And so that's sort of what I really want to focus on. And this has been triggered uh, by the fact that it's long been known that beta cells are functionally and transcriptionally heterogeneous. So this is um, from a review article from Danny Pippelis about 30 years ago that made the point that beta cells are highly heterogeneous. And this is a schematic from that article. And if you look at dissociated beta cells, some beta cells activate even at very low glucose levels, and they have high metabolic activity. And then some beta cells aren't activated until you have very high glucose levels and they have very low metabolic activity. They need a lot of glucose to trigger them. And then of course, some sit in between and sort of uh, activate around the physiological set point. It's also been shown that beta cells uh, in keeping with the sort of rhythmic behavior, isolated beta cells show oscillations, some fast, some slow, some very regular. And this has been known for quite a long time as well. And then, of course, uh, more recently, think, think techniques such as single cell RNA-seq has identified different uh, beta cell populations defined by transcriptional uh, profiles. And then, of course, uh, we had um, 
recently study such as uh, Patch Seek from Patrick McDonald's lab, where you can both look at electrophysiological properties and um, transcriptional properties of the islet and sort of get a sense of what the transcriptional behavior is that underlies vari variations in function. So we have this sort of functional and transcriptional heterogeneity. And so this has posed the question more recently is, because of this heterogeneity, could you have some cells that basically have this pacemaker-like property and act as a pacemaker for the islet? They are entraining the oscillations of the islets. And so you have this, it, this shows sort of an electrical response in an islet. You have this first phase, and then oscillatory second phase. Are there some cells that show these oscillatory patterns and drive that behavior across the whole islet? And so that's what the, the first thing I'll uh, address, um, if you like, in this, in this talk, but then sort of a little bit broad, more broadly in terms of sort of cells controlling the islet, there's other questions like are there cells that basically drive the elevation of activity um, or ma maintenance of activity in the islet? And are there cells that basically drive the initiation or sort of res initial response to nutrient stimulation. And um, the, you know, the, there's been studies recently looking at this and these different cells all have uh, been given names like leaders and wave initiators for this sort of pulse style property, hubs, first responders. And I'll, I'll talk about uh, those um, today. So the first question, is there a rhythmic pacemaker that controls the frequency of the pulsatile second phase of insulin release? And so I'll go back and I'll present some of our work and that of others. Um, so this is some uh, calcium imaging of an islet and you see this sort of rhythmic oscillations um, that are somewhat coordinated across the islet. But if you look a bit closer, there's uh, regions of the islet where that calcium elevates earlier and reasons where it elevates later. And this is shown more clearly in this profile here. So where that wave starts, elevates earlier, where it ends, elevates later. Um, and this requires there to be gap junction coupling in the absence of connexin 36, which forms the gap junctions of the islet. You have none of that sort of coordinated pulses and animals that lack this connexin 36, they're glucose intolerant. And I should point out this, this is in isolated islets, but this has also been on, observed in, in vivo. So we have regions that elevate earlier, regions that elevate later, sort of mimicking what we see in the heart with sinoatrial node and uh, the rest of the heart. Um, so just a little sidestep, I just want to introduce um, an assay we developed that show that sort of can probe the presence of heterogeneity in the intact islet. This uses optogenetics, so a light activated ion channel. And if you basically um, stimulate cell regions in the islet that have uh, uh, expressed channel rhodopsin to um, this light activated channel, it drives depolarization in that cell. And then that cell can then recruit activity in neighboring cells. So for example, if you depolarize this cell number one, you have these elevations in calcium. You see that come up somewhat in cell number two, but not in cell number three here. And we found that there was a wide variation of this activity that could be driven or recruited across the islet. Some cells basically had, did very little when you stimulated them, and some cells recruited varying amounts of their neighbors, some even recruiting a, um, you know, a large proportion of the islets. And the, some of the, the cells that had very little effect had low metabolic activity as measured by NADPH. And some of these cells that recruited a lot of behavior had uh, high metabolic activity and high NADPH. So within the islet, there's variations in excitability as measured by the ability to recruit their neighbors uh, to activate. So if we go back to looking at this propagating calcium uh, waves, um, we can represent that propagating calcium wave by this false color map. In blue are cells that uh, activate earlier, 
in red are cells that activate later, and this is a time course of that. And you see actually it quite, uh, it looks very analogous to that um, heart situation where these cells at the origin of the wave, where it first elevates, they have this sort of smaller amplitude. Cells at the end have this very high amplitude sort of mimicking those ventricular cardiomyocytes. And indeed, if we go and probe this, re this uh, origin region, the cells, um, well, so if we look at these, this origin region, the cells have this lower amplitude. They actually had less NADPH uh, response, and they showed less of this excitability as measured by channel rhodopsin. Whereas waves at the end showed uh, greater ability to recruit neighbors and a higher metabolic activity. So this was a bit unusual when we looked at this first. These cells at the origin seem less excitable. But um, within these islets there, or within individual bead cells, there was an inverse relationship between the NADH response and the oscillation frequency. So these cells at the origin, they're less metabolically active, but they have a higher oscillation frequency. And this sort of mimics that uh, heart situation where the cells of the SA node, they don't show as robust action potentials, but they have a higher intrinsic frequency. And so it seems actually now we have this very sort of analogous system in the islet. We have earlier, uh, earlier sort of cells that elevate earlier that uh, have this high intrinsic frequency, maybe less robust oscillations, but maybe that are they pacing the oscillations of the heart, of the islet. Uh, one point to note is this is in this sort of um, wave propagation it is intrinsic to the islet. It's not dependent on where glucose first hits the islet. Uh, as some people have uh, asked uh, this before. We uh, looked at this previously using a microfluidic device. Uh, it's got two parallel channels, a little gap in between, and that where the islet can sit. And this was uh, developed by uh, uh, in David Piston's lab. And basically, you can apply glucose to different sides of the islet and look at the calcium activity. And essentially, to cut a long story short, if you stimulate one side of the islet, then the waves always emerge from that region. But if you stimulate both sides of the islet, uh, or then stimulate both sides, so it's a uniform glucose stimulation, the wave propagation is consistent, but it doesn't depend on where you first stimulate. Okay, it's consistent irrespective of where you apply the glucose first, okay? So it's intrinsic to the islet, it's not dependent on the sort of pattern of glucose stimulation. So we have um, this rhythmic behavior, the cells intrinsically sort of uh, lie where the, or some cells lie where the wave uh, emerges. They are less excitable, but or less metabolically active, but have a high intrinsic oscillation frequency. So to then ask, you know, are they sufficient to be pacing the frequency of the heart? We turn to some computer models, and this basically we simulate lots of different uh, currents. Uh, we simulate a gap junction current, and uh, this is based on a model initially developed by Char and Noma, uh, Akinori Noma. Um, but when we couple it up, we get this sort of rhythmic oscillations. You see this sort of uh, consistent wave origin region uh, um, in, this, in this position here. And so we simulated an islet showing this behavior. There's a region where the wave initiates and where it terminates. And if we look at a time course, we see this earlier elevation in the blue region, later elevation in the red region. And those cells in, at the beginning in this simulation um, We've set sort of to randomize the heterogeneity, but they end up having um, possessing um, less metabolic activity compared to at the wave end where they have more metabolic activity. And their intrinsic frequency, if you sort of take them out of the simulation and simulate them themselves, they have this higher intrinsic frequency. So we sort of matching what we experimentally observed but the key thing is then we can remove those cells and see how the islet behaves. And that unexpectedly, when we remove those cells at the wave origin that's sort of leading the oscillations, we have very little 
um, change in the overall islet frequency or responsiveness. When we remove these cells at the end, those more metabolically active cells, the frequency does change, it becomes faster. So what we conclude from this unexpectedly is while there are cells that look like pacemakers, they show higher intrinsic oscillation frequency, they sort of lead the oscillations, that we find when we remove those, we actually have very little impact on the overall islet function. But in fact, those cells at the end of the wave, when we remove those, we do impact the islet. So it's more likely that those slower oscillating cells are controlling the overall islet. But to have a, a significant impact, you have to uh, remove a large number of them. So it's not like a small number of cells are driving this. It's more like a large, a, a much larger population are influencing the overall islet frequency and slowing uh, the oscillation. So that's our sort of conclusion from what's driving the rhythmic oscillations. We don't have some system like in the heart where there's sort of a, a cells that initiate that propagation. Uh, rather, there's uh, a larger population that sort of disproportionately influence the thing and uh, slowing the oscillations of the islet. So next look at, let's look at the, the second question. Is there a pacemaker? And I should put these in sort of uh, inverted commas. Is there a pacemaker that maintains elevated activity during the pulse tile second phase? So not driving the rhythmic pulses per se or setting that um, oscillation frequency, but just making sure there is some activity. So um, I'll go back um, just to briefly introduce um, some of the data I already presented when we stimulated cells that express channel rhodopsin 2, some cells didn't show much of a response and some cells show this very wide range in response, including a small population that recruited large proportions of the islet. So are they a pacemaker, if you like, in maintaining elevated activity? Um, more prominently, there, there's been a study uh, looking at um, cells called hub cells, where if you do some um, mathematical analysis of the, um, this sort of oscillatory dynamics, you can uh, identify populations of cells that look, show oscillations that are, let's say, more similar to the rest of the islet. Um, and they were termed hub cells. And if you hyperpolarize them, you disrupt the function of the islet. It lacks now this, uh, shows a substantial reduction in this coordinated oscillatory behavior. And that's quantified here. And so that led to the suggestion that there's a small population of cells that needed to maintain the activity over the overall islet. And so um, I won't go in depth in, into further into that study, but I just want to point out sort of this, um, why I think that concept maybe not um, um, completely accurate, because if you look at, this is data from um, Domenico Bosco's lab. Um, if you look, you, there's an assay where you can look at insulin release from single cells called a hemolytic or reverse hemolytic plaque assay. Basically the size of the dot around the cell represents how much insulin is produced by that cell. And so at low glucose, you see that these dots are quite small. At high glucose, these dots a lot bigger. And if you quantify the area, you basically see at low glucose, this sort of represents the distribution of insulin release. Okay, it's very broad and at high glucose, um, you have lots of cells that show lots of um, insulin release. And so intrinsically, most cells can release insulin by themselves when in isolation at elevated glucose. Similarly, if we look at the calcium activity of those connecting 36 knockout islets where they're electrically isolated, or we look at dissociated bead cells, most of, over 80% are responding at high glucose. Okay, it's almost very similar to um, a wild type islet. So basically cells intrinsically can respond to glucose and show elevated calcium activity, 
elevated insulin release. They, of course, lack those other mechanisms that are important for amplifying that insulin release. Um, um, but you have, the, you have this intrinsic capability of responding to glucose. And so I would conclude that there, it's unlikely that specialized cells are responsible for maintaining elevated activity across the islet because the cells intrinsically can do that. Um, just to sort of further emphasize that point, I'll just show a couple of other pieces of data that sort of highlight this. So this is a study uh, we performed where we deleted glucokinase in a population of beta cells within the islet. This was achieved by crossing a PDX CREER mouse with a FLOX GK mouse. We can introduce tamoxifen to delete glucokinase. And if we vary the amount of tamoxifen, we can delete the glucokinase in a very varying number of cells. And then we can measure calcium and insulin. And basically, as you increase how many cells lose glucokinase, of course, the uh, activity of the islet decreases, but it's basically, a, it's, it's pretty stable uh, up to a point. And it's basically where, it's only where about 60% of cells lack GK that the islet sort of shows this big drop in activity. Um, and you, when you knock out connectin 36, you can recover that partially. And so the islet can respond even when 50% of the cells or less are, or around 50% of the cells are responsive. So there is this very strong intrinsic capability of responding to glucose. Um, and so because of that, we did a simulation, uh, another set of uh, simulation experiments to look, are our cells um, disproportionately controlling the islet? So we have our simulated islet. Uh, we have variations in metabolic activity. So there's these yellow cells have high metabolic activity, these blue cells, less metabolically active. We can simulate the hyperpolarization of them. Basically, if you, if you stimulate the more metabolically active cells, the islet shuts off. If you stimulate hyperpolarized, the less metabolically active cells, the islet remains, remains reasonably active, matching the experimental uh, um, measurements that we, I just presented. However, if you remove those metabolically active cells, um, you get something very different. And then the islet is largely active still. And so this is, comes down to there's a fundamental difference. If you hyperpolarize one of these active cells, it's also going to hyperpolarize its neighbors as well. Whereas if you just remove it, you remove its complete presence in, uh, in um, potentially pace it, acting as a pacemaker across the islet. And so from this, we basically conclude these highly metabolically active cells are not required, again, for maintaining activity. And so we don't think there's a small populations of cells that really drives activity across the islet. And then, so the last question I want to address, is there a pacemaker that drives the initial response to glucose or other nutrients? And so, um, in this example, this is some calcium imaging again, and we see there's a region of the islet that responds first to nutrient stimulation. And this is distinct from those regions where that wave emerges um, that then propagates across the islet. And if we, quant if we sort of across a number of islets, look at this first, this sort of initial response region and this wave initiating region, the initial response region uh, is dis spatially distinct from these other regions, including cells that have this hub-like behavior as well. Um, this, if we then sort of provide a repeated stimulation, we can look at how consistent this sort of first responding region is. And uh, if we apply an initial stimulation, look at the earliest responding cells, upon a repeated stimulation, they are still um, earlier responding cells. And that applies to glucose and to some degree on, under glibenclamide stimulation, although it starts to become a little bit more like the islet average. So K2P channels have some involvement uh, likely in setting these first responders, but aren't solely um, 
define these first responders. And so we can ask the question, are these first responding cells important? And so we can perform a laser ablation experiment, in this case, ablating this cell, and then look how the cells, the islet responds in the absence of the, this first responding cell. Basically, pre-ablation, the islet responds very robustly, but post-ablation, that initial response is much more diminished. Fewer cells uh, do respond, and uh, it's a less coordinated response. Um, and the amplitude of response is also diminished. But this only occurs in small islets. In large islets, if you ablate one of these first responding cells, you don't have a substantial change. And that points that there's some redundancy present here. It's only cells where these first responding cells make up a, if you like, a significant proportion of the islet, are we having a big effect. And I should point out, this is um, similar to measurements that have been done in vivo and zebrafish, uh, where you ablate a, a sort of earlier responding cell, not much happens when you, um, well, and then not much happens when you f and subsequently stimulate uh, the islet, whereas if you can uh, ablate a single um, sort of regular cell, the islet still responds. Uh, I'm going to skip this. I just want to come to sort of a, a key point that applies to all of these studies is are these cells well defined or subtypes or do they represent more of a state? And so this is sort of a hero experiment where time lapse imaging uh, was done over about 48 hours and each time measuring that temporal response to glucose stimulation. And you have a first responding cell here, here and sort of maintained its position, but then later a different cell becomes the first responding cell. So the overall islet responsiveness is unchanged over this 48 hours, but the cells that respond earliest at time zero at four, around 48 hours are no different from the islet average. And so this sort of indicates they've got a half-life about 24 hours or so. Um, and so big question is this, these first responders represent more of a transient state. What about these other populations that have been implicated in pacemaker-like activity? Are they transient or are they defined subtypes? So overall summary, specialized pacemaker cells can entrain the dynamics and recruit activity in other physiological systems, the classic example being the heart. Bead cells are functionally heterogeneous and subpopulations have been implicated in regulating the dynamics of insulin release. Uh, for example, hub cells, lead cells, first responder cells, et cetera. Question is, are there pacemaker cells in the islet? And I would say sort of. Some beta cells do disproportionately drive elevations in activity or in train the dynamics, but it's very unlikely that small numbers of cells can solely drive the dynamics or activity across the whole islet system. It's much more likely that it's a large redundant population that are having this impact. And so in terms of the three questions I posed, um, small numbers of fast oscillating cells do not likely entrain islet oscillations, sort of this classic pacemaker-like uh, situation. Slow oscillating cells may disproportionately sort of slow the oscillation period of the overall islet. And that makes physiological sense because you want the islet to show slow, robust oscillations of insulin. You don't want these very fast oscillations of insulin. Um, small numbers of ex highly excitable cells do not likely maintain overall islet activity because bead cells intrinsically can respond to elevated glucose. Um, and just an extra point about hub cells um, that sort of been missed in, a, there's been a lot of conversation about these and what role are they playing? And something that has been missed is they may, um, and what the data really does suggest is may disproportionately coordinate the islet system by dint of them having uh, elevated metabolic activity. And that's a question that's, um, uh, I think should be explored a little bit further. And then the earliest or first responding cells, they can help drive and coordinate the first phase response, 
they do represent a transient state and they are, there is also redundancy in this situation. So it's, again, it's not like a very small number are driving the first response of the overall system, but a, a somewhat larger population are, are doing this. Um, and so I should acknowledge, um, um, of course, everyone else in the field that's contributed to this sort of understanding, but in terms of the work I presented, particularly Vera Kravitz, uh, a postdoc in the lab who has been working on these first responder cells. Um, and then Jen Droulet, who's been doing a lot of the computer simulations along with uh, some assistance from Jennifer Briggs in looking at, at sort of the questions of, you know, theoretically, how would these populations act? Um, and then of course, funding. And I'd be very happy to um, take questions or discuss further. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was excellent. I mean, a really just a beautiful walk through the the entire landscape um, of these islets and how they're functioning, you know, in the mice and and exploring the the nuances of how they're working. I wonder if anyone in the audience like to. It looks like two people have their hands up, so feel free to unmute yourself, Amelia. And I'm not sure who else is uh, has their hand up. One more. Oh, Guy Rudder. Guy, do you want to go first? Sure. I was sorry. I thought am I muted. Am no, I, no, you're good. No, we can. Okay. Hear you. Hi. Thanks, Richard. That was brilliant. A beautiful survey, and thanks for showing that. And thanks for you know mentioning those papers on hub cells and so forth. I, I, I guess uh, what I'm what I'm bound to say is, firstly, in terms of you know, demonstrating whether these hub cells are pacemakers. I mean, these were pretty hard experiments to do. The people who did it, David Hodgson, Natalie, um, who was a student, uh, you know, very, very talented microscopist, and it's hard to do, and I'd love to see those repeated. The second, to, to, to see if they're, um, you know, they can, they can be repeated. Uh, the second point is that we, <clears throat> you know, the evidence that these are, according to your definition, a bona fide um, sinoatrial no-type pacemaker isn't, isn't, very strong, but the evidence from those inactivation experiments, biogenetics, does seem to show that they are required to get transmission of waves across the islet. So, you know, they may act as a sort of break or something. Uh, and I still sort of cleave to that view. But the question, the question I wanted to raise was around, you know, your beautiful modeling work and the initial parameters that you set. To what extent can we be confident that all of those are correct? And you know how much wiggle room is there when we build these models around, you know, you, you know what those initial parameters are. You know, things like gap junction conductance and, and homogeneity of those conductances across the island and things like that. I mean, how much wiggle room is there? How much certainty or uncertainty is there? Yeah, so that's a really good point. So obviously, it's a model, and that you know, there's always the sort of people would say, you know, you can model anything. Um, I would say. You know, we started, you know, we've, we've worked with different multicellular models and we, the one we have, we really like because it can, it agrees well with lots of our other studies, like where you sort of um, hyperpolarize different populations of cells and look at different sort of K2P channel mutations and the impact on overall islet function. They agree really well with those. So it's, it's sort of pretty well constrained by sort of uh, describing existing data um, where we have heterogeneity and gap junction coupling. And then the gap junction coupling is sort of based on the experimental measurements we have done. Um, all the ion channel conductances are sort of matching work that sort of uh, Akinora Noma's lab did and from the literature and sort of getting it to describe reasonably well I bead cell oscillations. So I would say it's pretty well constrained and there's not a huge amount of wiggle room, but you know, we can't completely exclude that. Um, but in terms of like, you know, we can describe a lot of our existing studies. And so I'm pretty confident in those, those comments. It of course doesn't include alpha cells, delta cells and paraguay right. communication. And that's a key um, gap, right? Yeah. And so I think you can sort of, maybe we can say, you know, given heteri functional heterogeneity and gap junction coupling, we can make this conclusion. But if there's some, cell, if these say hub cells 
are secreting different factors, mm. maybe that can completely explain things and it's, it, it's a, a very different conclusion. Does that yeah. make sense? Perfect sense. No, thanks for raising yeah. that. And just, just a quick comment. I, I love your experiment deleting leukokinase in a subset of cells, the PDX1 CRE. Just whether it makes any difference or not, I don't know, but we postulate that the hub cells have rather low PDX1 activity. So they might be the ones where you don't get deletion. So that's a good point. That they're the, the ones you're not losing the PDX yeah. from. But thanks very much, Edith. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Guy. So, Amelia, sorry, I, we did. I'm, I'm not sure if she's still in line. If you'd like to unmute yourself, Amelia, and then David Hodgson is also with a hand up. So uh, she made, she she commented on the beautiful talk in the chat. So maybe that was her commentary. But how about David Hodson? Would you like to unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, hey, uh, thanks, Richard. Um, a, a nice balanced view. Um, and we've sort of discussed this before, right? Is that there's so many cells now doing stuff in the islet that the concept of disproportionate control doesn't really exist because every cell has a disproportionate role in the island, right? Um, but in terms of the hub cells, we try to sort of do it in a less biased manner because we're also, you know, concerned about various facets of paleoadopsin, um, you know, and, and strong kind of polarization. So we try to change the PDX1 levels in the island and obviously then kind of replicate all that data. But one thing we did notice when we did those studies is if we change gap junctions or if we dissociate the bead cells, they um, essentially switch to a different kind of differentiation state, right? They, 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 they lose this normal heterogeneity in PDX1 and so forth. So I'm just wondering sort of with the original gap junction knockout experiments, are some of those results due to the cells intrinsically changing their activity because the differentiation is changing as well as the electrical coupling? And have we become a little bit reliant on those experiments to inform the models? Because essentially what we would need to do is try and do a rescue experiment where we put connexin 36 back in as well as maybe do a bit of rna sec to, to understand what's happening and, and actually i think the time is right to go revisit some of, 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 of those data as well right because the models are there now yeah that's a really good question um yeah because you know these experiments on the connexin 36 knockout mice either for, that we did when i was in david piston and also in my own lab and what particularly Paolo Maida's lab done over a number of great studies, you know, they, yeah, they are, they're not conditional, they're, um, they're not sort of, um, um, what's the word, you know, they're deleting at, you know, basically at birth, they're not sort of um, an inducible deletion. And they could, and so there could, you could be right, there could be um, some changes in the intrinsic properties. Now, at the time when we looked at them, they do, you know, when you dissociate them or sort of, you know, look at them, um, you know, in isolation, they aren't that different from normal bead cells in terms of their general glucose responsiveness, right? So in isolation, a connecting 36 knockout bead cell and a wild type bead cell do look pretty similar. But I think the point, you know, in terms of like secreted factors and participation in paracrine communication, I think that's a a very good point. We are currently trying to actually um, do that rescue experiment where we overexpress connectin 36 specifically in the beta cells and um, yeah, do a rescue experiment. Uh, it's just been tricky breeding those mice because I think they, it seems like they're the transgenes on a similar locus to the, the uh, knockout. So I think that would be a really neat experiment, right? Because they're, 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 then if, if something happens, then kind of, you know, point proven but if something doesn't happen then there might be a wider defect but i guess there's just never been a decent flux models for some of the, the, the reasons that you've suggested but I, I think there's probably more than meets the eye right and i think it would be really yeah. interesting to kind of get the conditional models done i mean whichever way it goes it would be it'll be cool but um yeah i'll leave that to you as the gap junction coupling expert thank you thank you um yeah no i think that's it's a good it's a good point to to revisit because we're getting, you know, in general, a better handle on things like how, you know, the cal calcium activity through things like NFAT ac ac activation or NPAS4 or other uh, 
transcription factors regulates some of the transcriptional programs in the bead cell. And so I think that is uh, an important point. Um, anyone else have a question? I had a question. Can you just sort yeah. of talk a little bit about how your paradigm reacts to the Coxsackie um, B virus? You know, that's been implicated in some uh, cases of type 1 diabetes through some studies, Teddy studies and so forth. Uh, I think it's, um, and, and, you know, what are the implications there? So like, if the, you know, Coxsackie virus enters through CX36 or the tight junctions, then there's that kind of, you know, disruption. Then the virus takes over the beta cells, right? Protein production is disrupted. Would calcium, you know, coming back into the ER be affected? I mean, what what kinds of um, what kinds of disruptions can you imagine, um, you know, kind of, imp, you know, happening on these beta cells? And do you think that some would be preferentially disrupted versus others? Yeah, so I think I'll I'll um, I think my I guess my first um, way of addressing that question would be you know that there are some cells that have been you know suggested to be more you know like like say hub cells have more of an immature profile like less PDX one less um, I think less circa, but more, more susceptible to ER stress and death. And so if you have some viral infection of those, they may preferentially die. Um, as a result, you know, those cells that, you know, if they have a, you know, whether it's a rhythmic pacemaker-like property or a more general sort of role in, in driving a response or maintaining a response, that will sort of be diminished to a greater degree. Um, and I think, you know, the, you know, for example, maybe the coordination will be disrupted if you target some of those, those cells. Also, you know, more metabolically active cells are probably, you know, more resist, more, you're going to get probably more, some more DNA damage potentially in those uh, studies from Uval Dawes lab have shown, you know, if you have sort of elevated GK, you're more susceptible to DNA damage and thus um, some cell decline. And so I think oh, that, yes. you know, <laughs> yeah, those cells may be the sort of target of basically, you know, dying earlier, if you like, in some more generally in some pathogenic situation. Mm. And thus maybe, you know, things like uh, if we're talking, you mentioned about type one diabetes, um, maybe that's where you get sort of neoantigen formation or, um, you know, insulin peptide transfer to dendritic cells, if, if as has been suggested. And so they might be cells that we could want to look at for that. That's very speculative, of course, but yeah. um, it might be interesting there. It's really interesting. Sort of like, what is your thought from an engineering sort of standpoint? about the mechanism. Now, is there any other model? I mean, we've, you started off talking about the heart, right? SA node, AV node and all that. But like, is there any other model system? I mean, it, it's kind of, you know, it, kind of reminiscent of the brain in some ways, because there's systems in the brain that kind of act like this, right? One takes over okay. the other. And, but is there anything that you think mechanistically uh, emulates or, you know, the, the systems you're seeing in the, in the islets? Yeah, I don't, I mean, I think maybe even David Hodson would have a better idea about this, but, you know, some centers in like, some other neuroendocrine systems, right? Like, in the obviously, the architecture is a little bit more complicated, um, but, you know, like in the pituitary, maybe. Um, certainly, think, that's David? where, that's um, where, like, the um, sort of hub cell and sort of... Yeah, the, um, the, the pituitary is interesting. It's, it's a great model. Um, and you know, other biologists, including myself, have sort of reinvented the wheel a little bit on that just because islets are a bit more genetically tractable because you get many of them rather than one pituitary. But it's similarly electrically coupled, it similarly responds to input, and it similarly responds to secretical. And you do get a similar setup of cells in the pituitary. And actually, the reason for that, um, from an engineering perspective, is it engraves robustness because the whole point about heterogeneity 
is it allows plasticity and it allows robustness. So there's a lot of seminal work by um, um, a guy called Uri Allen uh, in Tel Aviv at the Weizmann, um, where they did this look at transcriptional circuits and then extended it slowly to sort of neural circuits. And it shows that this ability to, to be heterogeneous um, is, is ingrained in complex organ function. And it's, it's a trait of the, the higher mammals. Um, and you know, but, but that's why we're at a bit of a crossroads in the island because you know we have this electrical coupling that seems to override a lot of stuff. Yet we have this massive heterogeneity that, that the single cell screening approaches have all turned out. And we're trying to kind of figure out what's what's going on. And, and it's really complex experiments and it's really complex thinking as well. So I, I guess we'll get there. I think everything contributes a little bit, is what Rich is trying to say. And I think kind of what we agree with. Thanks for that. This here's um, just a, one more question. This has been such a fascinating talk. I think people are very interested in it, um, and uh, it 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 really pollinated the discussion. I would uh, let's see if let's from Vishal Parekh. Are there specific factors when depleted in alpha delta cells that affect the pacemaker or hub cells appearance? I was prematurely wondering if beta cell extrinsic, but yet islet intrinsic factors one can think would be involved here. Sure, yes, yeah, so when we're thinking about, for example, first responder cells, cells that sort of lead the initial response to nutrient stimulation, and when you ablate them for smaller islets, you have that diminished response. It does seem like um, inputs from the alpha cell, particularly sort of uh, glucagon, have, have an influence there. I didn't show that data, of course, but if we, um, if we, uh, apply exenin 39939 three, uh, and basically block GLP-1 receptor signaling um, in islets, you do um, disrupt the first phase response and the presence of those first responding cells. So I can say that. Um, I think uh, um, others have suggested maybe a link between the delta cells and uh, hub cells. Um, and there's questions, are the delta cells gap junction coupled or not, that I know uh, a few people are looking at. So certainly there could be, um, and we would argue the alpha cells have a role uh, from some initial data we have. Um, yeah, but there's a lot to be looked at there. So it turns out that this uh, this field of inquiry is really rich and ready for exploration. It's a it's a puzzle, but it looks like some many of the pieces are coming together. So it's kind of an exciting time, uh, it seems, in this field that uh, that you guys are researching and just really a great sharing. Um, the talk was wonderful. Thank you so much, and we'll uh, look forward to speaking with you again and 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 look forward to papers coming out of out of your lab. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for all the uh, nice questions. Great. Have a great rest of the day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.